And the subject that I'm going to be speaking on is called Go All In. Come on, tap your neighbor, tell him, go all in. <clears throat> Come on, tap your other neighbor, say, are you going all in? Amen. Amen. I'm going to read from James chapter 4, verses 3, and we're going to go in. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, someone say a friend of the world, makes himself an enemy of God. Someone say an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. Come on, that's a good verse. Hebrews 12 verses 28 through 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. <clears throat> Amen. Let's pray and then we're going to go into the word. Father God, we come before you. We thank you for today. We thank you for every believer, God, every non-believer, every person that has is, that is made their way here. God, we thank you for every person that is here watching online or in the second sanctuary. We ask you that your spirit may move, may not be my words, but your, more, your words. I step aside today, Holy Spirit, and I ask you that you step in. Touch the lives of every person in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody shout it. Amen. amen, amen, amen. Some of you guys see amazing shoe collection over here. I promise I didn't buy any of them. They all got gifted to me, but, and I'm also not selling them. And so, um, but I want to have an illustration here. Uh, you know, I would never buy these kind of shoes. I personally don't see a reason in buying shoes for $150. My wife, on the other end, sees no problem with it. And so she thinks it's like a piece of cake. So golf, on the other end, I, that I will speed. I will spend some money for that. And so here in, have you guys ever had like a piece of merch line or some shoes or some makeup, something that you were waiting for to come out and there was a drop date like, hey, this date, these shoes are going to come out or this merch is going to get released and you're waiting for the time so that you can go on the internet or go to the store and click buy and buy that shoe or that piece of merch or something. You guys know what I'm talking about? Well, have you ever got to that time in, um, you wanted, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting patiently and all of a sudden you get to this time where that's that day, the release date where you want to buy that piece of merch or that shoe comes and you accidentally take a big old nap and you pass that, that opener date, you pass that time where you could go buy and you wake up and all of a sudden you're like, oh shoot, I need to, I need to buy that shoe. So you go online and you go to that website and you Select that shoe that you want to buy that just dropped and you click buy and it says out of stock or unavailable. How many of you guys felt that pain before? Come on somebody, Lord healed their hearts. And so that just, just pain that they have to go through. You know, that example, I remember I was coming at a time and I wanted to buy something. It was out of stocking. And the next day I went to prayer and God kind of revealed to me, you know, it's funny, like as a preacher, everything is an example in a sermon. And so I, I went to prayer the next day and God was like prompted in my heart. He said, you, you, you know how, you know how you went to buy something? It says out of stock. He says, that's exactly how I want to be with every Christian that accepts me. Every Christian that says yes to me, that went I bought them when Jesus died on the cross. The Bible didn't pay for you on half price. The Bible didn't, he didn't send his son to die on the cross and pay for you on discount or he didn't pay for you on Black Friday or Cyber Monday or on 50% off. The Bible tells me and you that when he paid for us, the Bible says paid in full. And he says, when I paid for people, and they accept me as their Lord and Savior. I want them to realize in the same way you came to that shelf or to that website and tried to buy that shoe, that when the devil comes knocking to people's lives, they're going to realize that they, they are no longer in stock. They come to, the devil comes to a notice that that Christian is sold out for Jesus. Come on, somebody. 
The devil's going to come knocking at the door and he's going to realize that he can't get their purity anymore. Why? Because they're sold out. In that same way, God wants that kind of a relationship with us. Not that we're 90% in and 10% out, but that we're 100% in with Jesus. Why? Because he's worthy of that in our lives in Jesus' name. And the first point I want to bring to you guys today if you are not sold out for Jesus, you're still for sale. See, when, you know, as I'm youth pastoring and get to lead a, a young generation, one of the biggest things is, well, life with Jesus is boring. You know, how many of you guys felt like that? You know, it's, it's not as fun. And, you know, I was like, God, how do I respond to that? Like, I was trying to ask God in my personal time, God, how do I respond to a teenager that says it's not as fun? Because, you know, in all reality, yeah, they are having more fun in the world. And God says, the life that you enjoy the most is the life you go all in for. And I told him, I was like, ooh, thank you, God. That's good. And I told him, you want to know why the world's more enjoyable? Because when it came to the world, you went all in. But when it came to Jesus, we have our speculations. We have our concerns. We have our doubts. We have our, you know, when it came to the club, we're willing to pay a hundred bucks for an entry fee. When it came to tithing, the church wants to take my money. And it took, it came to this point where I was like, God, he began to download that revelation to me that if we could be as committed to the word of God as we were to the world, our life would look a lot different. If we were as committed to the spirit of God, than we were the sin of the world, our life would look a little different. If we were as committed to Christ as we were to culture, our life would look a little different. Our, our relationships, our finances, our family, our career, different types of things would look different, but we got to be all in for Jesus. Can I get amen? Can I get all in for Jesus? The world, the life you go all in for is the life that you enjoy. Why don't we enjoy Christ? Why don't we, why don't we want it? But be, it's because we're not going all in for it. Tell me, let me tell you something. The life with Jesus is the most adventurous, enjoyable life you will ever, ever have. The life with Jesus is the life you and I wish for. The life that the world offers is a counterfeit kind of a life. The life the world offers, it's fun. He, the devil offers everything you want with one hand. And then with the other hand, he takes everything your life depends on. We have to be sold out. When Jesus paid for us, he wants the devil to come knocking at the door of your life. And he wants him, the devil, to come to find out every part of you is sold out for him. He wants to come to a house that's not available. He comes knocking at your purity to say, devil, that was the old me, not the new me. This, the new me is sold out for Jesus. The new me is on fire for Jesus. The new me is drenched into the word of God. You can't touch me. You can't, the devil can buy, he can try to click as much as you want. You ever, you know, you want, if you just clicked a little harder, maybe if you refresh or something, the shoe might pop up, the item might pop up. We want to be as Christians, so sold out for Jesus. The devil can load and load and load. He can go to your ex, your next and everywhere, everywhere else. And he's going to come to find out. Zach's not available. He's going to type in www.zachpartook.com and he's going to try to purchase my purity. He won't be able to get it. Why? Because I'm sold out for Jesus. I'm after pursuit for Jesus. He's going to try to purchase my finances. Try to give me the compromise. What he can't do because I'm sold out for Jesus. The goal in life, the goal with the relationship with Jesus is not to give the world a million no's. It's to give Jesus one yes. And let me tell you something. One yes for Jesus is easier than a million no's to the world. Why is life so hard? Well, because I have to say no to this. I have to say no to drugs, to the girl, to this, to this, to that. No, 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 no. You just have to say yes to Jesus. Loving Jesus will make it easier to hate the world. Loving his presence will make it easier not to, to hate the, the party, the different types of things in the life. Can I get an amen? Yeah. 
See, but the, what it is, is how close. This is why it's hard to go all in. Because a lot of times, and I can say this firsthand, we, we, we live this life. How close to sin can I get so that I don't actually sin, but I stay in a relationship with Jesus? How close to the fire can I get? How, how close can I play with the fire can I get without actually getting burned, without actually committing the sin? And there's this little uh, uh, one foot in, one foot out relationship. And the thing is, that's not the relationship. The goal is not how much can I hate the world. It's how much can I love Jesus? Let me tell you something. God will help, help, help you hate the world. God will help you. See, when you taste Jesus, the world will lose its flavor. When you try Jesus, there's nothing like it. I tell our teenagers this. I tell our leaders why we struggle so much with students. Why so many students are in drugs and sexual immorality. I tell them, well, guys, that's the best thing they've tried. Let them try Jesus. Watch what happens. Let them experience Jesus. Watch what happens. Their life will get flipped upside down. They will begin to be passionate, not about a girl, but about God. They will be in a Friday night prayer, a worship night on a Friday instead of that party. Watch what happens when they try Jesus. The world loses its flavors. They begin to have a passion for Jesus. They begin to have a word. Jalen was nine months ago, didn't serve Christ. Now she's leading a whole school to Jesus. That's what happens when they experience him. You have to be sold out for Jesus. You have to come to a place where the world, even if it tries, come knocking. It can't get you. Church, this is a call for us to go all in. You know, I think, I, I don't know if it's Church of Corinth or Church of Ephesus, I think it's Corinth, where it says you've drifted far away. Come back to your first love. You maybe once you were all in, but you've lost the first love. Do what you did before. Come back. Maybe you were all in with Jesus, but then, you know, during your walk with Christ, uh, finances, the devil was able to get it. And, and well, I mean, I'm almost all in. No, 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 no. You have to be completely all in with Jesus. You have to come to this point. I want to to reflect where in your life are you compromising where in your life are you giving devil an inch because you give him an inch you will take a mile we have to go all in for Jesus can I get an amen, amen. my second point I want to bring you relationship with God will lead to reverence for God I truly believe I truly believe the biggest indicator of why people Flirt with sin versus people that flee from sin is the fear of God. When you lose the fear of when you lose that fear of God, now sin becomes temptation was always there. To get into the sin was always there. It's no sin is like shoes, it's available, it's on the ground, it's everywhere. It's it's every billboard, every post you look like, every every social media platform has sin crawling. No, I, I heard I think Jensen Franklin said, you know, 20 years ago, now you have to um no, 20 years ago, you had to search for sin. Nowadays, sin searches for you. 20 years ago, to watch porn, you had to go to the counter at the uh, gas station and be a little awkward. Hey, can I have the magazine? The what? The magazine. Just keep it down. Come on, bro. Today, porn looks for you. It looks for, that's why the average age somebody get exposed to pornography is 11 years old and it's only getting lower. It's only getting lower. Why? Because sin is so available. This is why us as a church, we're strategic. This is why Monday through Friday, we're praying for families. We're not going things at random. We're doing things strategic. We're uh, aiming after our next generation. We're aiming after families. Why? Because we want to be a generation that is all in with God. And that includes my family. That includes my friends. That includes my school. That includes my boss. That includes my wife, my husband, my kids, my nephew, my grandma, my grandpa. That includes all of us, me and my household, shall serve the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. It has to lead, relationship with God has, will lead to reverence for God. You know, 2 Timothy 2.22, it says, flee youthful lust. God calls us to flee from it. But the reason so many flirt with it is because we've lost 
the fear of God. Maybe we've once had it, but you know, over time, we've lost our first love. Over time, we've drifted away. Over time, we've came to a place of compromise. And today is the day that I want to say to you and to myself, let's go back all in with Jesus. I'm not talking about just church attendance. I'm talking about everything. I'm not just talking about 99% in. I'm talking about 100% in. Let's go in. Let's be radical for Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. No, in Genesis 39, 6 through 12, it says this, the story of Joseph, you guys, most of you guys know, and Joseph went through it all. He was the dreamer, all that kind of stuff. He went, got sold by his brothers. He had a dream, got sold by his brothers, got thrown into a pit, got sold into prison, went to Potiphar's, all that kind of stuff. Here in the story, he has, he's at Potiphar's house. <clears throat> you know, he's kind of, life is a little bit better now. And this is what it says. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Jo Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Peter, uh, Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come, sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than, than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How can I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. I want you to see how beautiful this is. Joseph didn't flee because in 10, she kept on pursuing, kept on trying to persuade. Come on, sleep with me, sleep with, sleep with me. And Joseph didn't. He actually ran from the sin. He ran from it and he didn't do it. And it wasn't because Joseph's better than you and I. It wasn't because he had more discipline. You know, I read the Bible more than you. It wasn't because he prayed more than you and I. It's because one reason, he had a re relationship which had reverence to his master. I want you to see this. Joseph didn't say, Potiphar doesn't want me to do it. He said, my master. What does that mean? First of all, there's a relationship. He knows his master. That relationship leads to reverence, a respect, a righteous fear towards his master. He's not just a bro. He's not just a guy. He's not just dude doesn't want me to do it. There is a reverence this is my master and I want you to see not just how can I do this to my master but it would be a great sin against God guys the key to not compromising to not flirting with sin is not just do better try harder it's trust more have a relationship with Jesus. Like I told you, relationship with God is not how many no's can I give to the world. It's how many yeses can I give to Jesus. God, yes, I love you. And as you turn away from the world and say yes to Jesus, automatically your back is towards the world. Yes. Your back is towards the sin. I don't want to. And God will, give you the, the, the God will give you the strength to hate the world. God will give you the strength to hate the culture, hate the, the sin in the world. In Jesus' name. There was a reverence and that it had started with the relationship, went to reverence. He had a relationship with the master, which caused a res respect, a reverence to his master, which led to a righteous response. He fled. I mean, he ran from the scene. He ran from the sin. This is what we want our generation to have. A righteous response in the face of temptation. A righteous response in the face of drugs. A righteous response in the face of alcohol. Sleeping around, sexual immorality. And it's not by telling them, no, no, no. It's telling them, go to Jesus. Go to his word. Go to prayer. Go to a relationship with him. Can I get an amen? And when you have a relationship with Jesus... You have a reverence. Your righteous response will be to flee from him. Flee from the sin. Flee from the scene. You will begin to see 
a reward. You will begin to see the reward. And at first it might be like, whoa, he, he got sent to prison. Yeah. Look where his life ended up. In the palace. See, the world will say, but look, you responded the right way. And you got the wrong outcome. You're looking at now. God called me not for where I'm at, but for where I'm going. Right now, I might be in the prison, but God has a promise for me. Right now, I might be in the pit, but he has a palace for me. And it might not be on earth, but it will be in heaven. And so for that reason, my response will be righteous. My response will be to flee from sin, not to flirt with it in Jesus' name. Someone shout, I'm all in. in. Come on, somebody. You're preaching. Come on, somebody. I want to give you... If you look at Genesis, there is a perfect recipe for compromise. Perfect recipe. If you read from 6 to 12, this is what it is. Joseph was hot. She was hot. She kept on tempting you. One day nobody was around, so no one's going to see. And then she took your cloak off, so you're basically naked. Perfect recipe for compromise. Nobody will know. Your wife won't find out. Your husband won't find out. Your kids won't. God won't. Nobody will know. Yet Joseph still responds by running from sin. And it wasn't because he's better, but because he had a reverence to Jesus. He had a reverence towards his master. This is why, guys, this is why we entrust young people, not just to sit in the pews and be spectators, but be participators. We don't say, hey, can you run the club? We tell them, no, no, you're going to run the club. We will come help preach, but you're going to lead your generation. Why? Because it builds this relationship. It builds this this, this reverence towards Jesus. I, I can't fall into sin, but why would I? God is calling me for too much. God is calling me higher. God has a destiny. God has a dream. God has a promise for me. Can I get an amen? The relationship will lead to a righteous response. Guys, the word of God will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the word of God. Joseph was willing to run, was willing to flee at the risk of looking funny rather than flirt at the risk of falling. That's the generation we want. The Bible says she kept pressure, putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused. He refused. See, compromises and well, I said no to the sin like for four days. And then the fifth day I came in. We want a generation that is pure after Jesus. That no matter how much this, the world pushes, no matter how much the world tempts, no matter how much the world tries, we will be a generation that will not fall into sin. We will flee from sin. We will pursue after Jesus, after righteousness, after purity, after good living, after the Word of God, after the presence of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen in this place? Even when it was right there in front of him. Nobody would know. He didn't do it. Guys, sin in your life is working even when you don't see it. You know, we know somebody um, in town that just got diagnosed with cancer. They have about like four or five kids. And on a time clock, expiration date for their lives has already started. But, you know, we came to realize the cancer in their life didn't just show up. It's been there. It's just now surfacing. And the cancer now is looking to take everything that this this man's life holds. That's how sin is. You look at Samson. Samson had everything. He had the strength. He was anointed. And when he hid the sin in his room... They were already there. They were already hiding. The sin that you hide, the compromise that you hide, one day it's hiding. The next day it's there to kill you. 
And here we see this person, you know, cancer, got a whole life, got a wife, got kids. Cancer doesn't care. Sin doesn't care. This is why we have to be all in for Jesus. Because it might feel like, oh, life is good. It's I got the money, the car, I got the family, the marriage, and I got the, you know, I got the sin hiding in my life. It's in the, it's in, it's under my bed. You know what's under your bed? The, uh, the uh, Philistines as well. The sin is not the only thing under the bed. Philistines are there too. And when the time is right, you see what happens to Samson. They take his eyes. Then they take his hair, which ultimately takes his strength. And at that point, wherever they led Samson, they went. Today, you control sin. Tomorrow, it controls you. We have to be all in for Jesus. See, sometimes might be like, well, I'm all in for Jesus, like majority. It's just like one part. Like one part of my life is, is not all in for Jesus. Can I tell you something? Compromise is not being all out. Compromise is simply not being all in. I'm going to say that again. Compromise is not being all out. Well, I still go to church. That's not what I'm talking about. Is there still room? For the devil to get you in your relationships. But I'm 90% in. I'm glad God didn't look at us in percentages. I'm glad when God looked at us. When he sent his son to die on the cross for us. He paid in full. The Bible says when the shepherd goes and he has 99. And one goes missing. He doesn't say, well, I got 99%, the majority. God doesn't look at majority of percentages. He says all. And because he died for all, he's worthy of it all. He is worthy of my, my finances. He's worthy of my relationship, my community, my purity. He's worthy of it all. And I tell teenagers this. You know, they're like, well, what if God isn't real? What if you're wrong about God? I tell him this, all right? Well, if I'm wrong about God and I serve him for the rest of my life, I have wasted a lifetime. But if you're wrong about God and he's real, you've wasted an eternity. Eternity, church, is not a game to be played with. Eternity, today we're here, tomorrow we're there. The Bible says tomorrow is not promised to anybody. And if you ask scientists, they say 10 out of 10 people die. You can look it up. Compromise catches up to you. There's two types of fire. There's a fire that you play with. And then there's a fire you pray for. The compromising fire brings pain. Consuming fire brings purifying. The world wants us to play with compromising fire. How close to the fire can I get without getting burned? How close to the line can I get without no stepping into actual sin? How close can I have part-time part -time commitment to Jesus and expect full-time benefits? But we don't do that. Compromising fire. A few things. Sipping saint, turning into a slipping saint. A little drug, vaping addiction. It's nothing crazy, just a little bit. Gambling, cheating, lying, deleting search history, following profiles on social media that you shouldn't. This is a common practice for me in my social media. I go through once a month and I unfollow all those. If I see it right away, obviously I unfollow it. But I go through it and I check the accounts and I unfollow things that might be a temptation to my eye gates and to my ear gates. The things that lead to my soul. I unfollow right away because like I said, sin is searching for you. And this is why we have to be all in for Jesus. Because if you leave one part of your life open, you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. If you open, up, open it up just a crack, he puts his foot in and he wants to take your life. He gives what you want with one hand and takes everything depends on your, in your life with the other. Unfollow those things. Protect your eyes. Protect your ears. 
be a generation that doesn't just dwell in the Word of God on a, a Sunday, but on Monday, listen to secular music. On, my, on, on Sunday, you're praising God. The other one, you're praising, you know, different types of things in, in life. Last thing, heavily involved in friend groups that aren't good. There's a lot other things. But then there's consuming fire. This is the fire that we pray for. Just in Hebrews, it says that he is a consuming fire. The word of God. We have to have a prayer life. Be able to go through prayer line, get delivered. Fasting, godly community, life groups, connect groups, discipleship, church attendance, serving the local church. See, just like a consuming fire, just like gold goes into fire and it brings up the impurities in our life that get wiped away and it becomes pure gold. We want to be a generation that is consumed by the fire of God so that when we look into our lives, we are pure Christians. We are Christians that walk righteously. We don't got skeletons in our closet. We don't got secret sins, but we're in the secret place praying. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> Let's be a church that doesn't play with fire, but be on fire. Can I, can, I, can I get an amen? Number three, piano player can come up. Jesus is worthy of everything you're scared of losing. Jesus is worthy of everything you're scared of losing. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus looks at his disciples and tells them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. But for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And you know, a little personal story. I became youth pastor in about 19 years old, 2019. And youth pastoring was the last thing that I wanted to do in my life. I was a drummer at that point. Um, or I think I still am a drummer. I go back quite, quite often, like Israelites going back to, want to go back to Egypt. And so, you know, they call me back, back there and I'm like, guys, I don't like the onions. I don't want it. No, I'm joking. But I didn't want that. I wanted to serve God through drumming and all that kind of stuff. And, and because I had a legitimate fear in my life. I had a fear that I'm not going to be able to get married. I'm not going to be able to have the finances in life to do what I want. Because as a kid, I wanted to give to the poor. As a kid, I've always dreamed of this, giving houses away, giving cars away. That's just, as a kid, I wanted to do that. I don't know why I thought drumming was going to get me there. But, <laughs> but that's what I wanted. And I thought, and you know, my mom can even testify. She would say, Zach, you're going to be a preacher. And I was like, no, mom. That's not going to be me. She's like, just watch. My dad would be, Zach, you're going to preach. I'm like, no, just, stop. and it was like, the more I said no, the more people were telling me I'm going to preach. I'm like, come on. So finally I had to say yes. <laughs> um, there was one time, you know, I didn't want to be a preacher, none of that kind of stuff. And at this point, I think 2019, I was already kind of youth leading, youth pastoring. And we had a youth service. And it was like two to three pews, nothing crazy. And it was on a Wednesday night. And I preached a sermon. And there was this new girl that came in, which was a shocker. I was like, new people, how do you serve? That's weird. <laughs> and they, she came in. Her name was Valexia. She came in. I preached a sermon. And she gave her life to Christ. And that's when I for sure knew Jesus was in the room. So I was like, my sermon was not that good. She gave her life to Christ. She encountered God at this altar. And I was like, great. The girls ministered to her. Next morning, I'm in a D Dutch Bros line in Kennewick. And I remember this day like it was yesterday. I was in a Dutch Bros line. I was three cars behind the, fr the front line. And I was ordering a drink. I was in my blue, light blue Nissan Altima. I was ordering a pomegranate uh, raspberry red bull medium ice come on order it it'll bless your life and i remember like yesterday i get a text from my now wife but she was she was just a friend back then and i got a text and she said hey remember that girl of alexia that gave her life to christ i was like yeah she said well yesterday 
was supposed to be the day that she ended her life. Actually, before service, she wrote out suicide letters and passed them out to her, to the, put them in places that when she's gone, her family and friends will find them. And yesterday, after the word was given, she gave her life to Christ, encountered Jesus, went back home, took back every single letter, reunited with her family, until this day she's alive. Till this day she's alive. And I remember in that Dutch Rose line, three behind the front, the presence of God filled the room so strongly. I came into a place because I was scared of losing so much. I was scared of, well, if I serve God, I'm, I'm gonna have to travel the world. I'm not gonna be able to see my family. None of that kind of stuff. I was scared so much. And the presence of God filled the room fill my car so strongly in that very moment I begin to weep I begin to cry in that moment and I begin to pray this prayer in that very moment none of my dreams none of my desires none of my wants none of that mattered in that moment I said God I'm gonna go all in for you and I prayed this prayer. I said, God, if I say yes to you, give me one promise. That when I preach the word of God, young girls like Valexia will get saved from suicide. People, will get people that are addicted will get set free. People that are bound will get delivered. People that are lost will get saved. Families will be reunited. Friends will be re get saved. Our schools will be saved. Those that are bound will come to know Jesus. Come on, somebody. At that moment, I didn't care about my accolades. I didn't care about the dream. I didn't care about the fame. I didn't care about the money. I said, God, I want to be all in for you. God, my life is not for your use. My life will be a vessel for the gospel. God, I want to be all in for you. I was scared. I was afraid that I'm gonna, it's going to cost too much. Can I tell you something today? You're completely right. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you a lot to follow Jesus. But it's going to cost you so much more not to. Jesus says here in Philippines, Philippians, Philippines, come on somebody. Philippians 3.8, indeed I count, Paul saying, indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For this sake I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. And in that very moment, I realize, God, no sacrifice, no amount of sacrifice I give to you will amount to the sacrifice you did on that cross. God, that relationship that I have to sacrifice for, uh, um, amount to what you did, it amounts to nothing compared to what you did. God, sacrificing the drugs, well, that's for your own health. Sacrificing that, it's, it, compared to what your sacrifice did on the cross, it's nothing. I count it as rubbish. And I remember in that moment, my life changed. I didn't care about anything. I told God, my life, use how you please. And that very life that I was scared of losing, I gained. You know, now along with my wife and our amazing team, we're in 10 high schools and middle schools across the city. 10 schools that we get to preach to about four to 500 students weekly that reach the gospel and three to 400 in our, in our youth ministry. Around 1,000 students hear the gospel every single week through, through this ministry. 
And the very life that I was scared of losing, the Bible says, if you lose it to me, in the end, you gain it. Let's say, let's say I lose it completely here on earth. At least in heaven, I gain it. But if I don't follow Jesus, I lose it here on earth and in eternity. At very least, on earth, I can say, God, I lost my life. So when I get to heaven, God looks at me. He says, well done, good and faithful servants. I don't care about this world. God, this doesn't mean anything to me. My life is a vehicle to spread the gospel. Come on, somebody. God, I will live for what you died for. You know, I'm going to bring this to an end. A couple years ago, I was, I was going on a trip to, to preach to a youth ministry in, in California. It was in Lake Tahoe, so there's some cool things to do. So I figured it would be cool to take the boys with me. You know, after I preach, we can stay a couple extra days and have some fun. Godly fun. And as we land, we get picked up. We're going about two hour drive to, to the cabin. As we're going up, we're going about 60 miles per hour, speed limit. There's a car comes around the corner, also going 60 miles per hour, hits us head on. That driver dies on the spot and I lose my best friend a week later. And you know, as I was in the hospital, you know, when they say your life flashes before my eyes, that was that. I, ever be, I remember I was in that hospital bed and I felt God just this, you begin to reflect. I said, man, if today were to be my last day, what does my life amount to? What, what did I do for Jesus? When I go up there, well, I can't take the, the money. I can't take the fame. I take of one thing, how many souls were saved through my life. And I remember in that moment, God began to speak to me, how many people in their deathbed, their biggest regret is not, I wish I did more drugs. Not, I wish I spent more time with the boys. Not, I wish I did more bad. Their biggest regret when they're in their last seconds of life is I wish I did more for Jesus. I wish I went all in for him. Why? Because all that, that I didn't go all in for, where, where did it go? It didn't amount to anything. It's nowhere to be seen. And in that very moment, I came to realize, God, no sacrifice that I, I can give will amount to the sacrifice on the cross. Yes, I can compromise. Yes, I can cut corners and maybe excel a little bit in life and maybe get a little bit ahead. But in the, in the end, I actually lose my life when I try to save it. But the best thing you could do is lose your life to Jesus because he knows best what to do with it. He's the creator of the world. He's the creator of you and I. And the creator knows best what to do with the creation. My life is secure in his hands. My marriage is secure in his hands. My family, though I may lose it, I I gain it in heaven. My life, though I lose it on earth, I gain it in heaven. Come on, somebody. No sacrifice you can do will amount to the sacrifice of the cross. Church, when the devil comes knocking, we be so in, so all in for Jesus. And then when the devil comes knocking, he comes tempting. He comes to a letter that says, sorry, we're all sold out for the cross of Christ. We're sold out for Jesus. We're sold out for his cause. We're sold out to see stadiums filled. We're sold out that our schools will not be drug addicts, but will be drug addicts, filled with drug addicts. Our schools will be filled with the gospel. We're sold out that we will not build bigger prisons, but bigger churches, that we will see revival in our city. Come on, if you believe it, stand on your feet and give God some praise. Come on, give God some praise in this place. Jesus is worthy of everything you're scared of losing. 
Jesus is worthy of the thing that you're scared of giving up. You might be scared. Whatever thing you're scared of giving up, that's probably what God is asking to give up. Why? Because most likely that's God in your life. Today, church, let's be a church that is all in. And when the devil comes knocking, he comes to an empty house. I'm going to tempt you with that girl. Yeah, yeah, the old me would have, you would have got me, but not me. I, I'm all sold out for Jesus. I know you thought you can get me in my relationships, but not today, Satan. Talk to the hand. I'm sold out. You can click, you can buy, you can shout, you can clap, you can, you can yell, you can crawl around the room, devil, but you're not going to be able to grab me. You're not going to be able to buy me because I am sold out for Jesus. I want us to close our eyes right here. I want us to raise our hands. We're going to begin to sing. Jesus is worthy of it all. Jesus is worthy of the thing that you're scared of losing. Jesus is worthy of maybe that relationship. Maybe in a business where you're compromising, with the finances you're compromising. Maybe it's in your purity. You're compromising in that. God is worthy of you surrendering that tonight, today. Maybe it's in the community. You're just around the wrong people and you're scared. That's all I know. Drugs is all I know. Alcohol. That's all my family does. Jesus is worthy of you surrendering that. I don't know what it is that you're scared, but Jesus is worthy of it. He's worthy for you to be sold out for Him. He's worthy for you to go all in for Him. Come on, let's raise our hands.